everyone so much for joining. Uh, we're really excited to be hosting our first um, online virtual meeting. It, it took a quarantine to get us uh, online, but we did it. Uh, events are such a big part of what we do at the Wilderness Committee, and so we're super excited um, to bring some wonderful speakers here with you. Um, to get started, I'm Peter McCartney. I'm the climate campaigner here at the Wilderness Committee, and I'm joined by my colleague Emily Hoffpower, the campaign organizer in Victoria. Um, I'm here on Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish territories in Vancouver, and Emily, of course, is uh, the territories of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples, and uh, I'll let our speakers talk about where they're calling in from uh, when they start. Um, so a bit about uh, why we wanted to host this, uh, you know, the Wilderness Committee were involved, um, you know, in the solidarity actions with amplifying and organizing kind of behind the scenes, some of the stuff in Victoria and Vancouver, and definitely our, our staff and myself and Emily were out at events and, you know, it was such a, such a powerful moment. Um, and it uh, felt very strange to transition into this isolated place. And so uh, we just wanted to bring folks together for, uh, for some reflections on it and, and sort of looking forward to what we can do next. Um, I'll read off some of the bios here. We have some amazing speakers. Uh, we have Freda Hewson, uh, the appointed spokesperson for the Innistoten clan. She has lived on her people's ter traditional territory for the past 11 years, building a village that now has a complete healing center, bunkhouse, and private cabins. Uh, a lot of you likely have been there. Um, and in there, they educate people to decolonize and protect the water, land, and air. Um, Frida, maybe if you can, I'm not sure how to pronounce your traditional name, so if you can uh, let us know. It's already off mute. You're uh, off mute. That goes it. I was cut. Which Perfect. means digs with a big shovel. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us. I'll uh, I'll just pass it over to you in a moment here, but we've also got um, Eve Saint. Uh, Eve is a performer at the Center for Indigenous Theatre and the daughter of Wet'suwet'en hereditary chief Wells. Uh, she splits her time between organizing in Toronto and land defense on the ground in her territory and was arrested on February 7th at the Gidimden checkpoint. Uh, hi Eve, thanks for joining us. We've got Nikki Sanchez. Nikki is people and Maya and Irish and Scottish academic. Uh, she's an Indigenous media maker and environmental educator. Nikki holds a master's degree in Indigenous governance and is presently completing a PhD with a research focus on emerging visual media technology as it relates to Indigenous ontology. And her and their next two speakers are part of Indigenous Youth for Wet'suwet'en who organized the, uh, the occupation of the BC legislature earlier this year. Thanks for joining us, Nikki. Uh, we have Gina Mowat. Gina is a member of the Gitsan Nation and does community organizing in Victoria. She's also working on her PhD in the School of Child and Youth Care at, U at the University of Victoria. Um, so thanks for joining us as well. And then uh, Colin Sutherland Wilson is Gitsan and Fire Fireweed Clan from Anspayax, spokesperson for the Indigenous youth during the legislature occupation. So thank you, Colin, for joining as well. Um, before we get to all our great speakers, I just wanted to, uh, to pass it over to Frida um, for some reflections on uh, the solidarity actions and the invasion earlier this year and, uh, and an update for how we're doing on the ground. Uh, so Frida, you have the floor. Hi everyone. Well, things have been quiet for everybody else that's been impacted by the COVID-19, but industry is still moving forward and still working and not practicing social distancing. And yeah, so they get to be considered a, what do you call that? Um, essential services, and it's not even essential service. Essential services should be grocery stores and places like that where we need to survive and they're still working and putting small communities at risk because there's uh, industry trucks, they're using the motels and the small communities like Houston is a very small community and they have two 
motels which have tons of vehicles parked that are industry vehicles and they put out a press release claiming that the local workers were the only ones that were working and they cut down to 400 workers but they're using the motels like makeshift man camps and have people coming in from all over the province and other areas and staying in the motels and traveling with more than two, three people per vehicle to the work site. And we've had them on camera where they're standing right next to each other, talking to each other. So they're not practicing social distancing. So they're putting these small communities at risk and coming from a small community like Houston, Smithers, Burns Lake, they don't have very big hospitals. And if they get people sick, our hospitals will be in trouble because we have only one floor in Smithers that services all the surrounding communities. So they're putting people at risk. And when you try to call them on it, they say speak to their um, communications person that they can't respond to us when we have them on video, questioning them why they're not practicing social distancing and putting the community at risk. And they just say that they don't they can't respond and you have to talk to their communications so we've been putting media out about that and so far since the arrests on in february we pretty much have been just watching vehicles go by and been trying to fight them legally and are challenging their permits so we did manage to get them their permit wasn't approved for parts of the territory so that they had to stop work. So right now they removed their man camp that they originally set up behind 66, behind our Unistatan village. And to me, I knew right from the get go that that man camp was never in the plans, but for court purposes to get their injunction, they claimed they needed to get behind our our checkpoint and we forced us to remove our gates because they said that they needed to get that man camp in and it never was in their plans. So now that they got their permanent court injunction, they went in after they got their injunction and started dismantling that man camp and moved pretty much most of the trailers out of there. So through and through they've lied to get their injunction and they used false information and so now they've taken that whole man camp down behind us. So they're no longer there, which is a good thing, but they're making a larger man camp further down on Gidim Dan territory, which uh, probably Gidim Dan will speak to that, but I'll just speak to our own that we're still battling through the court system. The injunction cost us about 300,000 in legal fees to fight, even though we knew we were gonna lose, they said if we were going to go for um, title that we should at least make an attempt to, even though through their system, because they filed for the injunction before us, we were in a, a defense instead of offense mode. And as you could see through all the studies that Indigenous people never ever win injunctions. Even if we did an injunction ourselves, the percentage is very low that we'd ever win. And these systems are set up for industry and government. And we've saw through all the releases gone out that the government has put out a lot of subsidies for these projects to move forward and blows me away that there's no money in it, that it's way down to a low, low $3 per cubic or whatever, how they measure it. And it's supposed to be at 11 cents and it's down to three, 11 cents to be profitable, and it's down to three cents. So why are they still pushing for this project is my question. I'm curious as to why they're still trying to make these pipelines happen when there's no money to be made in it. And people aren't taking COVID serious. People think it's just a hoax, but it is serious that it's easily transmitted and some people can be silent carriers. So you won't even know you have it. And that's why they tell everybody behave like you actually have COVID and keep your distance from people that don't live in your dwelling. So, and I see so many people that aren't practicing that social distancing, especially CGL, which is putting these smaller communities at risk. So, and the government's allowing it. 
they're not even though people have been complaining and filing complaints and we've been putting it out on social media and how they're not even that they're allowed to keep going even though everybody else is required to shut down so yeah we're still battling legally we've taken their um do my mind's dead i've actually been getting rest in the first time in a long time because of the social uh lockdown like the community's in lockdown and we're not taking any new people into our camp right now because of the COVID, because we don't know where people have come from and and because you can't tell right away so we're not right now we're whoever was at the camp are the only ones that are allowed in there right now and even myself i had to social distance myself from the camp because I was doing all the shopping and going into spaces and they weren't practicing social distancing in a lot of the shopping places when I when it first started so I had to self-quarantine myself at my daughter's place so I'm almost up on my self-quarantine so I should be able to go back to my cabin which I'm getting excited about to get back to the territory so yeah and we've been fighting their permits and like i said we were able to stop the few of those permits and right now we're challenging them on them not doing their studies properly and we're getting studies done regarding the salmon and the water which they, i don't believe they have done and we're doing that to use that against them to try and block their project from happening because they're crossing many of our rivers and those are salmon bearing rivers I think that's just about it because everything's been quiet and we're still we built a cabin and they're trying to get us to take down that cabin we we've always had a plan for a cabin and it's right directly in their route to protect another stream that's on our territory and they stuck notice on it trying to tell us that we're blocked or we're breaching the injunction and telling us we had to move that cabin but we've fully completed that cabin so and it's always been in the plan for for the purpose of trapping and there's a medicine village right beside there and we wanted to occupy more of the territories and it would be for part of our healing center where we would take people when they want to need to be in isolation for part of their healing they would go to these remote cabins away from the larger group that would be at the healing center to do some of their healing so it was always our intent to put more cabins all over Unistatan territory and we're not letting a project just because they got an injunction dictate to us how we're gonna utilize our territories and we've already had these plans long before CGL came into existence so we're not gonna change our plans for them we're gonna keep proceeding with our plans on how we plan to utilize those territories to get our people on the land for land-based healing. That's it. Great. Well, th thank you so much for sharing that, Frida. I'm sorry it took a pandemic for you to get some rest, but I'm glad you're, uh, you're able to rest up a bit. And we're, we're all really grateful for the work that you and your family are doing uh, on the land. Um, we're going to move on to the question and answer period. We have uh, some questions prepared for the panelists. and. Uh, Speakers, I'll just remind you um, in order, I'll ask a question and then just unmute yourself if uh, if you'd like to answer it. You don't have to answer every single one. Um, and uh, I'll just check and make sure everyone is, is back muted again before we move on to the next one. So uh, the first one is sort of for the uh, for the other speakers. And, you know, we're curious, we, we heard so much about the lives that you uh, all were busy at beforehand and uh, First of all, just you know, what made you decide to drop everything and and lead some solidarity efforts? I guess is this um, for anybody. This is for okay. any of the speakers. So um, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Eve. Um, I'm here at Get Him Done Checkpoint uh, 44 in Wet'suwet'en Territories. Uh, my father is a hereditary chief of this uh, territory. Um, and uh, for me, um, 
I found it to be very crucial that I, I, I be out here and I had to make the quick decision to uh, leave my life in Toronto. I had a quite a busy life with school and um, just some of the work that I do some, um, cause I do some organizing over there as well. And um, I just found like found it to be very important to me that I, I just, I, I have to drop everything and I have to be here. And I just had to make that ultimate sacrifice um, just because of the, uh, the climate that we're in, like the state of the world, the climate crisis, and um, also the destruction that this pipeline, CGL, going through with Suetan territories um, will bring to the communities here. So I had to factor all that in and um, uh, make the stand with, with Freda and uh, Unistodin. And um, so, it was uh, a difficult decision, and but I'm really happy that I made it. Um, I wouldn't have been able to live with myself if I got on that plane uh, back to Toronto. And um, I just knew in my heart that I, I had to be here and do everything that I possibly can in my power to help. Um, you think you're so small, but um, you, you kind of maybe underestimate yourself or sell yourself short. And you don't give yourself enough credit that, you know, like you can, you can, you can make a difference. And um, I, I've pr proven that to myself because I really doubted myself that I could do this or, or um, that I can make an impact. But I'm happy. I'm happy that I was able to do that for my people and for the land. And um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Anybody Colin, else? I saw you had some words to say as well. Oh, yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Neil Fox, Colin here. Uh, I guess with everything going on, like I was a student at UVic, and I was in the final semester of my bachelor's degree in environmental studies and indigenous studies. And yeah, with what happened uh, following the the international call of solidarity by the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs. Like I, I simply couldn't be in that mind space anymore to continue on with my studies. Like uh, the fact that the government of Canada was so deliberately smearing and attacking, you know, the governance systems of, you know, our neighbors, the Wet'suwet'en, Eskixan, and you know, in turn, really undermining our own governance systems like it was just all too big it was on such a large scale that you know i knew i couldn't stand by and so i had to just drop my courses and being in victoria being situated you know at the place where all these decision makers were ultimately planning the ways in which to undermine the rights and title of our traditional governance systems that was you know where i felt you know at that moment maybe I can make a difference. And so thankfully I met up with all sorts of people, made a wonderful community down there and we ultimately rallied together thousands on the steps of those legislature, uh, the ceremonial gate there. And, you know, it was, it was huge and it was big for me to start thinking and, you know, realizing where I might fit into the whole picture. And, uh, to directly be addressing those politicians in that building, to be addressing the media, to be learning constantly, to be trying to keep up to date on what's happening, and to try to look at the wider implications that this whole situation has for all nations. Because it's very clear, regardless of your background, you know, whether it's, you know, the rights of people or the environment or, you know, any other struggle you can imagine, what's happening on what's owed in territories is the cutting edge of all of that in Canada. And this is really something that everyone should remain focused on. And, you know, when we mobilize our numbers, we can strike fear into those politicians. Like after the day when all the entrances of the legislature were shut down, it took John Horgan a complete day to actually address that in the media to recover. And still you could see he was shook. And, uh, you know, that's when they're starting to realize that we can hold them accountable. And that 
you know, when we are in these struggles, we're not all alone. And uh, like everyone everywhere can do this from wherever you are. And just to realize that, you know, first and foremost, like the government, you know, is very deliberately trying to use this entire situation with the pandemic and with the, what they're doing on the Wet'suwet'en territories to undermine the indigenous governance systems of all indigenous peoples within this country. There's huge implications for their actions. There's a lot of danger to what they're doing. And especially we need to realize, like very contrary to the government statements, that this is not a domestic Canadian issue. This is international. They are employing the RCMP as a military uh, force to invade the sovereign territories of another nation. That is what Canada is doing right now. And all to exploit their territories against the will of the, uh, the leaders of those lands. And so for anyone who has any pride in their governance system, who has you know, any respect for human rights and respect for indigenous peoples, like, like we've really got to hold this government to account. We need to make it clear that what is happening is unacceptable and it's a violation of so many laws and basic human rights. You know, it's a violation of Wet'suwet'en law. It's a violation of even Canadian law. It's a violation of international law. And I think there's nothing more important right now for us to address because a victory, you know, for the, for the Wet'suwet'en peoples, you know, it's a victory for all of us. And then that's something that, you know, I'm trying to learn how to, you know, what my part is still. And I've returned to my homeland to Gixan territories and ultimately, like my heart is invested in this because I want a good future for my people. I want to see us strong and sovereign and uh, to be able to live our lives as human beings unimpeded on our own territories, just in the very basic sense. And so doing everything I can right now to support, you know, our relatives on the, on the Witsoed and Yenta to support the Dineze, the Sakaize, the Skaize. You know, I know that's going to reap huge benefits for all of us because we're all in this together. And, uh, you know, colonialism, it's, it's a big deal and we we're going to overthrow it together. And, you know, it's going to be hard work, but ultimately, I, I think we need to start looking at this in the big picture. And uh, for myself, like this was too big for me to focus on my own studies or my own personal affairs. Like I, you know, really had to jump into this and, you know, I'm still only nascent and I have so much respect for the people that have been on that Yinta for so many years and for the, the Wet'suwet'en peoples who have been holding it down for all of our sakes, who have given me so much pride as a Gixan to realize that, you know, we can uphold our laws on our territories. We can hold uh, the, the colonizer to account and that we do have so much power in our laws and our strength and our voices. And like, ultimately, you know, I, I see a strong sovereign future for my people. And, you know, a big part of that vision came from what I've seen on the Wet'suwet'en territories. So I'm so thankful for the, the strength and uh, the, the resiliency of the people there. And so, you know, I, w I want to, extend my gratitude and also you know with that knowledge comes the responsibility to you know to work hard to do my part to innovate and to do my best to hold Canada to account and yeah whatever I can do like I'm ready so hum yeah awesome thank you for sharing that call and uh, definitely saw some spirit fingers go up in the in the chat here watching all the uh, uh, I wanted to give Gina and Nikki a chance to chime in if they'd like. Uh, otherwise, we'll move on to the next question. Sure. Um, yeah, just echo to echo some of what Colin said. I think that, well, also the fact that it was a year um, before, like a, a year had passed since the first um, militarized invasion on Wet'suwet'en territory. And I think that that memory hadn't faded from people's minds. and 
I think that people had after the first um, invasion, people committed themselves to hold the government accountable and say, we're not going to let this happen again. And then it did happen again. Um, and so I think that indigenous folks and settler folks alike couldn't sit by um, while that blatant um, human rights violation took place. Um, and we're at a point where we can't look away and we can't pretend it's not happening. Like it's in our face, it's on the media, it's in social media. And so people um, rose up together and I don't, it wouldn't be enough to do a rally. Uh, we had to do something more. And I think that like Colin was saying in Victoria, we have an opportunity in the capital of this, um, you know, violent colonial um, province to look politicians in the eye and ask them questions and we did that as a group of thousands of people or over a thousand people um, when we shut down the legislature but over the 17 days that's what we were there for um, we were there because we didn't want Frida and the the Wet'suwet'en and their supporters on the Yinta to think that they were doing this work alone because we also know that the, the work that the Wet'suwet'en are doing on their territories is for all of us. And as I, you know, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I think a lot of the youth for Yinta at the legislature, we all know what our homelands mean to us. And we know that it's more than just a parcel of land that in our lands is our ancestors and our teachings and our survival. And so we know what Frida is fighting for and we know what the what's Odin are fighting for. And so that's the spirit that we brought to the legislature. And I think that a lot of us, um, a lot of us are urban that we're at the, um, the legislature, but we all carry those teachings and we know what our homelands mean to us. And we um, are ready to fight for it um, because, you know, what we were, we were doing at the legislature is a continuation of a struggle our people have been fighting for a really long time and so that's kind of, that's the spirit we brought with us but um it it did kind of the fact that you know this was the second invasion and knowing what, what sacrifices people were making up north um that energy came out in all of us like we couldn't hold it in anymore um like what colin was saying you know it's our duty and um as young indigenous people that were at the ledge, we we didn't have a choice and none of us could, you know, go home and feel good about being comfortable in our cozy homes, you know, doing our work um, as normal. So we had to do it. Um, and we just, you know, spoke over and over again that we wanna, you know, do everything we can to support the Wet'suwet'en to take the boot off their neck because that's what solidarity actions have the ability to do is, you know, release the boot off the neck of the folks on the front line a little bit and keep them safe by keeping them um, visible. And so I think that, well, that's definitely why I, you know, got involved with the ledge occupation and that sentiment was shared a lot um, by other folks as well. Awesome, yeah, I think. A lot of folks are feeling that. Um, Nikki, go ahead. Piali, I'm actually here with Katie George Jim, who um, was also present at the the ledge and whose territory we actually were um, holding the solidarity action on. Um, and I'm just I'm, I haven't been uh, I haven't actually gotten to see some of my ledge fam uh, face to face. So my heart's just really happy right now to see some of the people who I got to like sleep on the steps with for. A uh, couple of weeks there, and I, I think um, as much as I could try to put words to it, like we were called, everyone who came, and it was really incredibly beautiful to see the diversity of people who came, age-wise, um, nation-wise. Like people were called because it's a time, it's a time um, where we've come to a place that we can no longer tolerate what is happening, and um, there were so many misconceptions. Um, and so many prejudices that were precipitated by the media and the representation of who we were as uneducated or um, unorganized or violent. And um, ultimately the collective uh, level of intelligence, um, level of cultural knowledge, level of integrity um, that was brought forward in the solidarity action that we held, what we built, you know, it was 
simultaneously something um, that was incredibly painful and there was a lot of sorrow that we were collectively holding with one another. But there was also this incredible sense of solidarity and love and power. And especially as like, I know Colin was in studies and, and I know both Gina and Morgan as well are currently doing their studies. I'm doing my PhD. Ironically, the more that you understand about colonial history in Canada and government policy and RCMP policy, the more that you understand the only way to actually defend the land is to put your body on the line. And so as painful as that is to recognize that the people who you love and care for and want to protect um, potentially are at risk of violence, especially knowing, um, hearing directly from people in Gindem and in Wet'suwet'en what they were experiencing, um, it felt like the absolute least that we could do to be there with one another and, and hold down what we were holding down. And I think, like Gina said, um, the difference between um, a protest versus an occupation really speaks to where we are at in the tra trajectory of colonization in Canadian history, that we're at a place now where it's, it's we, there is no option to stay home. We know about Oka, we know about Gustafson, we know about all this historic violence that somehow is sanitized in history, and yet these actions continue to go on and are, are portrayed um, with the Canadian kind of public psyche as though there's any kind of validity other than actual land theft and genocide occurring. Um, and what we saw in Victoria and that I hope that we'll see continuing as an outcome of this is that the majority of people who came, like Colin said, to shut down the legislature were not Indigenous people, were settler Canadians who have enough of an understanding of what their own government is doing that they were willing to risk their, their personal physical safety and their freedom as well. Um, and so as much as possible, I really hope that people come to understand that this isn't ultimately an Indigenous issue. This is actually a Canadian issue um, that, that should and will divide the Canadian public and their understanding of their own government's genocidal policies. Katie, do you have anything to add? Okay. All right. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I'm just so thrilled to have you all here and uh, and and thanks for all your words already. Um, so I guess the next question I have for folks uh, and anyone can jump in of the speakers, uh, you know, why do you think that this this caught fire uh, and, and there were actions all across the country um, and other nations that were standing up? I guess I'll go. I believe that um, everybody realizes that we're already past the tipping point with uh, climate change and everything around us is showing us like even this COVID right now is a result of the elites that are greedy and don't like through our traditions, we only take what we need and make sure we put back and make sure there's, we're not gonna wipe out the resources so that's there for generations to come. And the mentality of the elite structures right now, that what they call the economic wheel, you look at all the industries that have come and gone, they over exploited the resources till they depleted it all. And then that industry was gone. And they do that to every industry they've ever hit. You look at the gold rush, you look at the, the logging where they over logged and, and because then when you over log, it's all dry and you had all the forest fires. We have everything around us showing that we're in trouble. The planet can replenish it itself, but we as humans, we cannot. We depend on fresh, clean water to live. And if we decide we're gonna destroy all that in the name of making money, it's not like we were starving. And you look at all the food, I was just reading because all the restaurants are closed, they're throwing away all the food because of COVID, the COVID-19. And there, it's just a culture of waste. And to me, all of what's happening around, it's called a wake up call to us as humans. And there are many people that have already waken up and those are the people that were on fire and doing what they needed to do because they knew their lives depended on it and they needed to do something. And it took 
all the people right across Canada when they, sh when they said they wanted to shut down Canada because the leadership was not listening to people. And when you don't listen to the people, because the political structure is set up that people vote you in and you're not even listening to them, of course people are going to rise up when they know what is, what is happening is not right. And people's lives depend on it. Whether they, right now they're blinded by money, but eventually, like you look at right now, the money doesn't mean a thing when everything is collapsing right now. And it's because they've been pushing, pushing for things that aren't gonna go anywhere. Because right now we're in trouble because they keep pushing for things and eventually mother nature fights back and we have to just face the consequences of it. So I believe people that were, they're tired of listening to the fakeness of saying they're gonna reduce the emissions so that they could slow down climate change, but they're not, instead they're subsidizing industries that are gonna increase the emissions for climate change and speed track everything, which makes it scary for us why we're doing what we're doing because we need that water, we need that clean air. And you look at now that everything is shut down, all the cities that have polluted airs, you see blue skies, clean air. Probably people never breathe that kind of clean air in how long. And so that is my view that people, a lot of people that were already awake are the ones that were standing up because they're doing it for themselves and their next generations to come. Definitely. Uh, I think you're darn right about that. Um, I see Eve had a hand. Maybe. Okay, there we go. Um, I, you know, I still like think about shutdown Canada and um, uh, going on um, why I came out and the decision I made to be here. Um, I was here um, when, when the Tsutin leadership uh, evicted CGL off the territory. And um, I, just, I just found out about it like as it kind of came up, which I knew um, it was going to be a very powerful thing. I, um, I knew what it meant, what it's going to mean that, you know, that powerful re reclaiming your power, that it was just going to catch like wildfire and, and what it, what it, what that would mean to indigenous people all over living on their territory or living on the reserve and feeling powerless, um, and and just stepping up and so again i i knew that i had to i had to stand with that and i knew that that even if i had to lay my life on the line um and you know like face that that rcmp violence that uh people who stood on the yinta like um you know were willing to face um you know it just if that could um you know give that power to our people our indigenous people and not just our indigenous people our allies who stand with us to reclaim our power to stand with us to um to be in this together it was such a beautiful thing such a powerful thing i would do it all over again if that means that you know we would have the same outcome and um, i just knew in my heart that it was a very powerful thing that was going to happen and something that i would go all the way um the way it played out and um, it was just from what other speakers have, have mentioned about, um, you know, it comes down to our indigenous rights and, and how like it was being, um, how we have 
been trampled on all these years and enough is enough and to get that power and to use our voice and we did all of this shut down canada with our voice our medicine and our bodies we're on all unarmed all peaceful and all had our spirit and that's what we used and that's how powerful we have have been i i so I'll say I still use it because we're still very powerful and we still have that. And even though we are all, you know, like held hostage by this, by this virus, like we're still finding ways to use our voice. And you know, yeah, I, I found that to be very, I still hold that. I still hold that with me and I, I talk to my partner and people like wow we are a part of that and and it was such a beautiful powerful thing and um yeah that's my my feeling and, and my thoughts about that so thank you thank you freda and their hereditary chiefs and molly and everybody out there the youth at the legislator in victoria and all the indigenous people and allies out there like we just did an amazing thing and we'll continue yeah okay that's it <laughs> right on um gina go ahead yeah um just to add to that i think that what was so special about this moment was that and this is something we talked about at the ledge a lot was that what sparked this um, movement was like was the power and the strength of our people and inspired by when when Frida the video came out of Frida evicting coastal gas link from what's Odin territory that was the moment and that's what inspired indigenous people and indigenous nations across Canada to say oh yeah you know Canada and the problem like the feds and the provinces will do all they can to make us think that we don't have our jurisdiction on our territories to gaslight us and and they do everything they can to get us to forget who we are to forget our laws but we haven't. And then they sprinkle crumbs here and there and try to make us think that that's compensation for all of the harms that they cause us and continue to cause us. But in that moment when Frida said, no, we're evicting this huge company, corporation from the territories, that inspired a lot of people. And that's not out of, you know, our oppression and, or, you know, the hatred we have for the state that, came from a place of power and love and that's what what sparked these movements across the country and you know woke our people up and i know that in gixan territory you know that's what our chief said and colin will probably speak to this but you know our chiefs went out and and our people came out in in huge numbers to to stand with the Wet'suwet'en, and that hasn't happened in a long time although we have been allies with the Wet'suwet'en for you know thousands of years but um i think that's what was different um about this this moment and it continues to feed this movement is that it's you know we've also built community and relationships with people um in victoria and at the legislature indigenous folks you know that had been living in the city together for years came together for the first time and we became you know kin and those relationships are you know we're not we're not related through struggle or oppression or hate we're related through through love and through relationships that are older than colonialism um and we talked about that a lot so that's i feel like that's this the you know unbroken chain that's you know that comes from our ancestors you know resisting you know for as long as they have and then you know coming from the Wet'suwet'en and through to what we were doing in Victoria and across Canada is this love and duty for you know to protect our land and to you know create a safe future for all people so yeah those are just some of my thoughts awesome thank you um Thank you, Colin. Colin, go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, that fire that was lit was so profound. And I've heard many people refer to the fact that, you know, BC and Canada are, are waking up the sleeping giant. You know, we're 
everyone is realizing how important what is happening on the Inta and its implications for the rest of us. And like Gina mentioned, uh, on Gixan territory, we saw that very profoundly when uh, in support of the Witsoid and the, uh, our hereditary chiefs, uh, Spoch, Gwininit, and Dawamuk were all arrested in on Spoch's territory in New Hazelden. And so when the RCMP came and arrested our leaders on our own land, we saw so many people from all throughout the Gixan nation show up on that highway. And they shut down the Highway of Tears, Highway 16. And uh, there was semis piled up for kilometers and kilometers in both directions. And uh, the RCMP remained there blocking the road, but just very quickly, so many Gixan showed up, so many people. I was calling with my brother at the time, and he told me, Wuggy, you won't believe this, there's millions of Gixan here. And those cops were overwhelmed. There was not enough police in northern BC to deal with the amount of Gixan that showed up on that highway. And they built bonfires on that highway, and the police couldn't do anything about it. And in the end, they said, we will stay until our chiefs are released. And so then they brought them back in the early morning, and then they went home. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of power that we can pull together. You know, if our hearts are as one, if our minds are as one, you know, if we stand behind our leaders and we seek to uphold our way of life on our territories, like we see the strength that we have. And, and all that strength comes from our ability to speak the truth. Because on that territory, like Spoch is the law on Spoch territory. Because Spoch speaks on behalf of that house and is the spokesperson for that people and has the responsibility to protect that territory in accordance you know, with the Ayuk. And so, like what we're seeing is, uh, you know, more and more people having pride in their laws, their governance, who they are, and realizing how powerful they are. And that through wielding the truth, you know, you can combat the blind violence of the Canadian state that perpetuation of colonialism, all those mechanisms that have been introduced since its inception. Because in all reality, Canada is, you know, still the, the colony that it was at its inception. Its purpose is still to dispossess the land of the original inhabitants of these, you know, of Canada, the so-called state of Canada, in order to facilitate the extraction of wealth you know, for the international and domestic entities that profit on our exploitation. And so, like, we need to hold that to account. We need to speak the truth as to what is happening. We need to, uh, you know, become empowered within ourselves. And uh, when we all band together, like, there's not enough cops that could stop us. And, uh, you know, most importantly, like, to rely on our truth, to rely on our laws, to be uh, confident in who you are, to be confident in your community, in your history, in your ancestry, and to just know that, you know, there's nothing to fear when you have the truth behind you. And so I think a lot of people see what is happening on those territories, and they realize that, you know, it is possible to make change, you know, through your integrity, through, uh, like, your laws, through standing up for who you are, and, uh, you know, that's pretty unique in the state of Canada because there's so many things that need to be addressed from the climate to, uh, you know, the, the, the narratives that they're perpetuating about these uh, you know, industries being essential services to, uh, you know, all this propaganda that's essentially geared towards dispossessing people of territory, undermining rights, and all of that. So... You know, to hold on to the truth and to employ it in a way that strikes fear into Canada, I, I think that's very powerful. And there's so many people who have been waiting for this moment for so many generations. Like everyone has been waiting to jump on board and to start upholding themselves, upholding their people, upholding their laws and protecting their territories. And, and I think right now is the time to do it. If they, shot, if they thought that shutdown Canada was bad when all the blockades were happening, 
like wait until summer when it's actually comfortable to be outside because all that happened in the middle of winter. So I think, you know, given the right circumstances, this country is going to see, you know, people mobilizing in a way that they've never seen before. And so I think it's important we keep up the discussions. It's important that we, you know, continue to use the truth to speak, uh, you know, from that understanding that comes from your ancestry and your laws and to, to hold that authority and to, you know, ultimately for all of us to respect each other's sovereignty and human rights. And so I think right now, this is the build up to something huge and we all need to get on board. And so like that fire is burning, but we need to stoke it, build it up and, uh, you know, set the, the colonial status quo aflame. Hamia. Awesome. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Nikki, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just Nikki briefly introduced me earlier, um, but my Ait snake, um, my Indian name is Huishwacha. Um, and my mother is from Sook territory, um, just on southern Vancouver Island, um, where the West Coast meets Coast Salish territory. And my father is from Wasaitnich Wits territory, from Wasaikum. His name is Talit Mutsten, and my mother's name is Kwetstana. And it's an honor to be, you know, in the virtual presence of so many folks. And uh, to Frida, I, I just say hello. I'm sorry we have not met in person, but um, I think as also if Molly is on this call, just really what came to my mind immediately is the, the essence of, of sovereignty and the way in which we display that to each other um, is through a state of being. And to see that fully displayed over how many years of just the camp and the type of direct action, but also to see the continuity in, in generations and the example that that sets. And we talked quite a bit, and this is to Gina's point as well, around not being connected through oppression and through violence, but being connected through our ancestral ties and relating to the land in which we're all belonging to. And so to see matriarchs themselves on the front line and directing just the heart of our future while carrying a baby, while caring for families, alongside everything else and just showing the type of future that we can have in our present while also recognizing all of our histories tied into one. You know, the fire has never gone out, you know, and for it to be <laughs> lit so brightly and to reach so far with its warmth and to really be able to lend a match to other fires to ensure that they also don't go out. I think it's just rather beautiful to see no matter who you are, where you are, and who you belong to and where you belong. I am just so, I'm just so humbly grateful for every single one of your moments on your territory to show the rest of the world, to show us, to legitimize our existence and the laws that, that are inherent to our bodies, inherent to the land, that, yeah, just every, yeah, I, I think that just that spark, and it is so far reaching that um, people are willing to commit to the, the rest of their lives to ensure that you know, one, like attack against the Yinta, attack against a single person, whether they're unborn or living or has come into the past, that is worth every ounce of our energy. And you've, you've displayed that for your family, for 
your future ancestors and I just yeah really wanted to share that and that's something I've been thinking about for a long time and to answer maybe the part of the first question is that's I felt like it was my responsibility um, to my own family to ensure that I made it public that I made it very clear that you are also all of our relations and my family and so yeah Heichka Siam I think just to add on the reciprocal of um, what Katie has said and, and along to what Frida said earlier on is really questioning uh, the underlying motivation to push this pipeline through even when there's not a valid economic um, uh, logic behind it. Um, and just to really recognize that Unistoten for over a decade has been globally significant as a site of Indigenous resurgence in praxis in a tangible way. And as a documentary filmmaker who's worked with Indigenous communities in every continent of this earth, every single one of them is aware of Onis Doten and every single one of them has modeled their movements from that place. Um, and to not, to not also recognize the ways in which Onis Doten and Mauna Kea and Standing Rock inform one another and the strength in the solidarity that we that we create when we do put our bodies on the front line in the way that that emboldens movements around the world of other indigenous people who are in, in exactly similar um, situations in, in terms of having to actively use their, their own bodies to defend what should be their sovereign territory. Um, we really have to question why when there's alternative routes that were, that were agreed upon, this singular route that specifically goes through Unistoten, which is also the very end of the Highway of Tears, a healing center there. Why is that what needs to be taken down? And I think when we really question what the ultimate message is there, it is a much larger metaphorical message around a colonial mentality that wants to crush indigenous sovereignty, that symbolically wants to state through its industrial destruction, the disregard of indigenous sovereignty and land defense and, and jurisdiction over indigenous territories. And that's a message that not only goes out to other nations across, uh, across Turtle Island, but around the world. And so that's one of the things that, you know, Colin and Takaya and all of the speakers, when we were at the ledge, constantly said every day, multiple times a day, you know, if this, this, is, if this is happening to what's so it can absolutely be happening to any of our territories. And that is absolutely the truth. But when you look at a colonial global history, the ways in which certain reservations like Pine Ridge, certain places like Haiti, places that actually have actively stood up against the colonial state and the colonial powers and made an example, those are the ones who intentionally then are, are sought over to, to really be made an example of in terms of destruction and disregard. And so I think because of what Unistoten has meant to so many other nations and so many people as a beacon of resurgence, that's another reason um, that has motivated this kind of disregard and disrespect as a, as a larger message that our state, um, regardless of its lip service to reconciliation, what its ultimate objectives are. And on that, on that note, I just wanna say, I was one of the organizers for I Don't Know More back in 2012, eight years ago, that took place on the very same steps that we occupied in February. And at that time, the crowds were one-tenth of the size and almost entirely indigenous. And I think that one of the inadvertent and beautiful outcomes of this whole kind of uh, performative dance around this notion of reconciliation is that settler Canadians have inadvertently been educated to their own history. And so to see the difference in the demographics of who showed up with Shut Down Canada versus I Don't Know More, suddenly it wasn't just Indigenous people who were coming up to stand for Indigenous rights, but it was Canadians who even in this kind of really superficial way became aware of their own collective history as, as settler people actually came out with the responsibilities to stand up in accountability for the privilege that they carry that's been directly derived from the extraction, removal, dispossession of indigenous lands and territories. That's awesome. Well said, Nikki. Um, thanks for sharing that. Uh, Next question is a bit of an impromptu one. We've noticed um, there's a Don Wright on this call, who is also the name of the premier, uh, the deputy premier, 
And so I'm wondering if there's anything that our speakers, if there is a representative of the government on the call, uh, would like to would like to share, or what what message would you like to send to uh, to Premier Oregon in his office right now? Well, after I heard he was on the call, if he's, if he's indeed watching, I saw in his bio that he's supposed to be in the economic field. So I'm just wondering why, if there's no money to be made in this, why are they still pushing? Is it just to save face? Because they've put so much provincial and federal subsidies into this industry that's going to increase increase the emissions and why are they still pushing it? it's just i think it's just to save face themselves because they've invested so much into a failing industry that they're going to be have to face their shame because i don't see this moving forward i believe we're going to go through a recession and i believe all these projects with all the money they sunk into it, they're gonna lose all their money. That's my belief. That's my belief what's gonna happen that they're foolishly spending taxpayers' money on a failing, like this is at the end of its tail, the, the resource ext extractive industries. So to me, it's plain foolishness that someone that is in the economic field would continue to pursue something, but then I guess if it's not your money, you don't care. It's the Canadians, people that pay taxes money that they're fooling with, and investors' money would be teachers, RCMP officers, because I heard one of the investors, that's where they were coming from, was their pension money. So they're going to lose all these people's pension money by being foolish with the investment. And the other thing I forgot to mention that my sister pointed out to me when all these, um, when they were blocking the ports, so the government ought to thank the people that blocked the ports because they slowed down that COVID-19. If they hadn't done that, we'd probably be in a worse state right now. So they said the government should thank those people that blocked the ports because they slowed things down for us and gave us a chance to position ourselves to battle this virus. And if it weren't for those people blocking the ports, we'd probably be in a worse state right now. So they ought to thank the people for blocking the ports. Right on. Um, Gina, did I see a hand raised there? I think Colin has his hand up, then I could speak after Colin. Okay, sounds good. Colin, go ahead. All right. <clears throat> There's definitely a lot of things I would love to say to the Deputy Premier. And uh, maybe I'll just start with, uh, you know, why is it that this government is still so insistent on continuing the same strategies of extinguishment when it comes to our rights and title as Indigenous peoples? Like we saw this all up front with the Dalgamuf Gisdewe court cases like ending in 1997, where, you know, the government of British Columbia suffered a huge defeat when it was made clear that BC had no authority to extinguish the rights and title of the Gixan Wet'suwet'en. And so what do we see after that? Like a predatory consultation and treaty process, we saw the shift to industry in regards to consultation and, you know, ulterior strategies of undermining and extinguishing those rights and title. And, you know, coming up to the modern day where, you know, this government is still insisting that, you know, rights and title be pushed aside in order to facilitate the, uh, the exploitation of our territories. And uh, in our meeting with Scott Fraser, I'll just bring this up briefly. We, uh, we had a meeting with Scott Fraser, uh, the Indigenous Youth for Wet'suwet'en were invited inside. And ultimately, we raised questions regarding the RCMP and the recent complaints commission that 
you know, the body that oversees the RCMP, which made it clear that the RCMP were going beyond their lawful duty, that they were using their powers in a way that was not uh, conducive to Canadian law, and that ultimately they were not accountable whatsoever to uh, any entity within Canada. And we brought that up to Scott Fraser, and he told us, oh, we have no, absolutely no influence over what the RCMP do on those territories. And yet, immediately afterwards, we found out that uh, the extra use of resources in order to, you know, conduct those operations on Wet'suwet'en territory were directly, green, directly greenlit by the BC government. Then we asked about the EAO process and the permits that were, you know, being violated on the daily and... Uh, you know, the fact that these permits were not, you know, entrenched and fully complete, as the Premier had been saying in numerous press releases. Uh, and ultimately, once again, Scott Fraser said, oh, we have no influence over the EAO. And so over and over, we see this dodging of accountability, this lack of leadership within our government. And ultimately, just this idea that, you know, everything can be dismissed. And, and uh, you know, when it comes to the premier himself, you know, when we were out on those legislature steps, you know, he kept referring to us as, you know, protesters or like a mob or, you know, ultimately doing everything in his power to not address us as who we are, which is the youth of numerous indigenous nations from all throughout this country, many who represent current and future leadership, the people that this government will be speaking to in the future along these lines. And we were dismissed as a mob. And that's very akin to, you know, the ways in which our people have been dismissed as savages, as primitive, you know, all throughout our history. So where is, where is the integrity of this government in actually addressing the things that we were bringing up to the forefront? Where is the integrity of this government in having those hard conversations in good faith? Like, how can you have good faith negotiations with uh, the Wet'suwet'en leadership when you're holding them at gunpoint, when you're exploiting their territories. They tried to make demands like the Gixan had to take down their blockade before meetings would happen, you know, based on that same idea of good faith negotiations, yet they're not willing to do the work to uh, present themselves in good faith. Like, uh, given the, uh, the dynamic of Witsoden being a sovereign nation, you know, the one another good faith metric would be for the leaders to go meet in person, as had been requested time and time again, for Premier Horgan to uh, make that visit for Justin Trudeau. And yet over and over and over, you know, John Horgan insisted on trying to paint like uh, indigenous leadership as being, you know, a group of dissidents or doing everything in his power to uh, to smear you know, the, the governance and laws that protect those territories. And so where is the honor in that? This entire approach has 100% not been geared towards uh, establishing just relations going into the future, where we can all combat these issues that come at us like climate change or even, you know, the many other unexpected things like this recent pandemic. Like right now, this government is not at all focused on doing the work that it has to do for our collective survival and our collective future. And right now it still insists on just trying to tear down the sovereign indigenous nations in order to make a quick profit. But then we realize what profit is there to be made with this project? There's just a point to be proven and a very petty one at that. So just please show some leadership and like we can all work together we can sort this out, but it has to start with dialogue, and it can't happen when a military force is being used to invade a sovereign nation. Like, that's very basic. So just hum ya. Thanks for hearing me out. For sure. Um, Gina, before we go to you, I got a message from Eve uh, while Colin was speaking there uh, that her phone's about to die. I was, you know, frontline life is. Uh, so Eve, if you have anything to say. Uh, Go ahead. Oh no. 
Oh, I think it just cut out. But uh, Gina, go ahead uh, and we'll see if we can get Eve back. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I was also um, going to reference the meeting with Scott Fraser. Um, I a message that we kind of continue to relay over the um, time at the legislature and um, which has been coming out of what's owed in front lines too is just the um, the uh, the national inquiry um, the report on murder and missing indigenous women and girls um, a federal report recognized by Canada um, and in that report there is a section on man camps um, and transient workers and when we were in the meeting with um with scott fraser and i would also you know if don wright is on the call um i'd like him to hear this message as well um but when we were when we were with scott fraser we brought it up that um there's, it's been declared through this national inquiry in the report that um, there's a gender genocide happening in Canada right now. And that man camps and transient workers on our territories exponentially increases violence against women and girls and two-spirit people and trans people. And so how can any leadership, um, the pr provincial or federal with any integrity, look indigenous women in the face and say that they're okay with with um with pushing through these projects that will um create more violence in our communities um it's something that you know i it's so it's hard to believe you know that that the leaders are are willing to um you know sentence us to death for uh, an economic bottom line, as Takaya says, and um, yeah, I just I want it. I want Don Wright to hear that because when we asked Scott Fraser, and actually before, you know, the young folks in the room locked down in the legislature, that was one of the last things we asked him was, "Are are you gonna put man camps on what's Odin territory? Continue to put man camps on what's Odin territory?" and put our women, girls and two-spirit people at risk of being murdered. And um, we asked him if he'd do anything to stop that. And he looked us in the eyes and he said, no. And, you know, that's for settler people, you know, you might not, it, it's hard to believe, like, unless you see it and, you know, be like asking Scott Fraser to his face that question and him just saying, nope. It's hard to believe, but that is the reality. That's the that's our reality. Um, and so, yeah, I want Don Wright to hear that. And I don't know if he has a response, but it's certainly, you know, to me, a huge, 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 you know, question within this whole project. You know, not only are you know these projects destroying our lands and undermining our laws and our governance system, but they're they're directly putting our our women who are already vulnerable at higher risk of being murdered you know along the highway of tears so yeah i i wanted to share that and also i wanted to share that with folks about you know how that ha went down in the scott fraser meeting you know behind doors um but that's the response we've gotten from provincial leadership is you know that they're not willing to do anything to protect our women, um, but uh, but the opposite, they're willing to take measures that will put our women at higher risk of violence. Um, and that's our leadership, um, that's BC leadership. So yeah, uh, thanks for listening, Don Wright. For sure, thanks, Gina. And uh, I'll see if Don has a chance to respond, but I wanna give Nikki a moment to uh, to speak her truth as well here. Or a chance anyway. Yeah. Mm. Okay. You go first. Um, I mean, I think this is, I mean, I've, I've said this already, but I just really feel as though it's really um, a point that has been very intentionally neglected in terms of the media discourse and the narrative that's being shaped. Um, uh, across Canada around these movements. They're not protests, um, they're sovereignty movements. Um, and so the fact of the matter is, this isn't 
um, just a marginalized communities that are that are infuriated that there, there is a very significant um, percentage of the Canadian population that as well is not okay with this. And, that, and that's one of the things that we said when, on the day that we shut down the legislature, the day of the throne speech, is that, you know, as Canadian settler uh, citizens, this is your government to handle. And so ultimately it's not um, as like what would be much better is if the majority of us could actually go and work in our own communities and work with our own language and work with our own land-based practices and do that restoration work and Canada could handle itself. Um, but I think that the, so much of the disregard for these movements, even when, like Frida said, we shut down ports, we shut down railways, we probably did, if you look at the COVID maps that track across North America, the number of cases, we absolutely, in shutting down Canada, really reduced the number of cases um, that were spread across this, these territories. But ultimately, I think what needs to happen is our, the, politic, the politically elected leadership who we unfortunately really got to see right through during our time um, on the legislature steps when many people came to visit us and made false promises and were unable to stand by their commitments. And just as, as both Colin and Gina spoke to in terms of their discourse with Scott Fraser, but ultimately what Don Wright and John Horgan need to understand is that it's not necessarily the Indigenous communities that they need to be so worried about, but it's their actual constituents, the people who they've told lies to, it's the people who ultimately hold the political power who are now totally being disillusioned and understanding the type of cowardice and the type of greed that is leading this country. And I hope that that spikes a lot of fear in, in when they try to sleep at night and understanding that suddenly this, this populace is waking up and coming to understand their own accountabilities as settlers and visitors of this land. Katie, do you have anything to add? No. Okay. But it would be great, Don, if you're on the call, uh, we can see that you're there. It would be really great to have a response from you, especially as an elected leadership, as someone who actively sought out a position of leadership that requires accountability to your, your constituents. Yeah, um, thanks for that, Nikki. I'll, we'll maybe, I'll give Don a moment if uh, he would like to mute if he is on this call. And share any uh, response to these folks. Oh dear, I can't. Uh, you're still muted. Hello, uh, is Don Wright here? But I'm the wrong Don Wright. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, so I, I know there is a Don Wright within the provincial government, but I'm actually with the Vancouver Office of Amnesty International, and uh, we have done a lot of work around the impact of man camps on Indigenous women and girls uh, in BC and across Canada and around the world. Uh, and so uh, I totally understand uh, what the guest speakers are saying, and, and I'm my empathy is totally with their position and and our work is totally with what their concerns are um and i and i regret that there is a don wright with my name <laughs> in victoria who is not uh so uh empathetic and understanding and taking the action that needs to be taken so so uh sorry about that um that it looked like it was a eventual uh you know government official listening in on this i am listening and i am learning and i'm appreciating what our guests that your guests have said tonight Thank you, Don, I'm to put you on the spot for no reason like that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that was it was really valuable to hear what folks um, would be telling the provincial government if they were listening and uh, and what what they have to say. And so, um, as we get towards the end of uh, of our program here, I do want to get to some questions from the audience. Um, but before that, I did want to say, you know, is there um, I think a lot of folks are wondering right now what they can do to support uh, what's what in sovereignty and, and the continuing cause and, and to act in solidarity. So um, if, if folks can give a, a, a quick answer to that.
Well, what I keep telling people is to continue to educate people that it's not over yet, that, like I said, construction's still happening. And I believe it's in June when they plan to start laying pipe. So fires are still lit. People are still waiting. And I know for sure the chief said it's still a definite no that they never ever approved these projects. And even though we're fighting through the legal system, challenging their permits, they still plan to try and push forward and to lay pipes. And we still absolutely say no to the project. And we know the legal system was flawed and giving them their injunction because they used uh, band councils partnerships but if you look at the pipeline route none of the pipeline is going through or near any reservations it's through with Suwoden territories which is the jurisdiction of the hereditary chiefs and all the hereditary chiefs still stand firm and saying that they don't want these projects so and like I said, I believe the economy is going to collapse and they're going to just stockpile those pipes and they're just going to rest away. That's my belief. But at any rate, keep people educated and keep people doing these webinars to educate more people and reach outside our circles because I'm pretty sure it's mostly people that already know what we've been doing or are listening to the webinars. So try and reach out outside those circles to educate people, teachers, and other, the rest of people that live in your neighborhoods that don't know about what's going on. They listen to mainstream media, and you know what mainstream media, they work hand in hand with the government because that's where most of their resources come from is industry and government. So they're not gonna cut off the hand that feeds their industry. So you can guarantee that you hear most of the propaganda that's out there with media and they don't really research well, what's truth and what's false and a lot of false information has been getting out there and for us there's a lot of people speaking claiming they're chiefs when they're not the head chief for speaking for territories and there's a lot of that going on out there and the medias are running with their stories to create further divide among our people but the public thinks there's a divide, but our people are still in unity that uh, through our fee system, we've held feasts and stood up and spoke to the reasons why we didn't want these projects because it's gonna destroy water, destroy the land. And you can't undo what they're gonna do if they destroy it. And that's why we fighting so hard to protect it because it's the only water that you can still drink from and we still utilize that land. We are running land-based healing programs, which we were supposed to start, but that project blocked us from actually running our programs that we successfully got funds from First Nation Health Authority to run land-based healing programs because that is really what's gonna heal the land is to heal our people. And that's what has always been our motto. If you heal the people, you'll heal the land because if you get people connected to the land, they're gonna protect the land. Right now, there's so many people that are disconnected and are living in city centers and all you see is cement. There's no life there. I know that because whenever I go into the city to do these talking events, by day three, I just feel like all the energy is sapped right out of me. So I can't imagine people living in the, these cement-filled places where there's no natural life still living there. So that's the problem that uh, we face is People are have a disconnect. You got to learn how to reconnect with nature and reconnect with the water. Learn how to respect the water, how to respect the land. If we respect it, then it'll survive. And so people can help by educating yourselves, follow our page. We try to keep it up date as best we can, but everybody's so isolated and separated from each other so that we haven't really been able to keep things updated on our page. But We'll try to get it more updated. Like I said, I had to quarantine myself because I kept going out in public spaces and not being fully protected. So I'm in self-isolation because I don't want to 
get our people sick that are still out at the healing center or healing village. So I'll be going back there in the next day or so. So thank you all for all that you are doing and all those amazing young people that are out there and doing everything they can for their, for their children, their grandchildren. Educate, that's what we need to do. Awesome. Anybody else want to add from Indigenous Youth for What's What? Nikki, go ahead. And then Colin. Colin, do you want to go ahead and I'll follow you? Uh, sure, I can hop in. But yeah, just that exact same note that Frida was saying, like uh, educating your communities, educating yourself, staying on top of the information, and ultimately, like uh, employing the truth because Canada has no legal authority and it certainly has no moral authority, you know, on the territories in question. And so when people realize the truth, when they understand what is happening, like it's pretty plain and clear that Canada and CGL are in the wrong. So the using that knowledge to uh, mobilize your communities and, and along those lines too, like we have to be making the preemptive efforts like everything can't be a reaction to uh, these large events that we see taking place, such as raids or, uh, you know, these, these catalysts for, uh, you know, that, that implore us like through our, our emotions to, to react. Like we need to be getting ready as communities. We need to be empowering ourselves. And like for everyone watching, like you need to find your community. You need to find the people that you can work with because what's happening on what's in territories you know, it's certainly not the first of its kind, and it's certainly not the last. And everyone needs to be ready at any time to mobilize, regardless of the issue, because we're all in this together. And so, you know, get ready now. Educate yourselves, educate your friends, your family, your community, and ultimately be ready. Like we saw so many examples of what could happen with Shut, shut Down Canada. We've seen so many examples like... Uh, you know, with people occupying different spaces or different events, different actions, but that all needs to be sustained. And uh, we're in this for the long run. Like for many indigenous nations, like these communities of action, of direct action, of, you know, standing up against the colonial status quo, we've been fighting it for a long time. My parents, my grandparents, going back to the inception of colonialism on these territories, you know, they've been arrested, they've been detained, they've been fighting the struggle their whole lives for countless generations. And so like build up your communities, join in the struggle and uh, be ready to mobilize. Who knows what's gonna happen in the summer? Who knows what's gonna happen in a few months? But just to start to be ready to hold this government to account, like you have that responsibility, you have that power and uh, you know, get creative, rely on the truth. And ultimately, you know, there's nothing we can't accomplish if we're in this together. And so build yourselves up, become strong, become smart. And uh, yeah, I think there's definitely no limit to the things we can accomplish. Hamia. Thanks, Colin. Uh, go ahead, Nikki. Yeah, I, I mean, I echo uh, Colin's words in terms of one of the things we really can do right now is tending to our relationships and the power that we have. I mean, um, it's so difficult to be in a time of um, uncertainty and crisis and not be able to be with one another in, in each other's physical presence. And that, I think, is what gave us so much power um, when we were occupying the legislature. So many of us didn't know each other prior to that, but coming together um, and, and standing with one another and having faith that we would, you know, protect each other and have each other's back emboldened us and gave us so much power so really in the time that we have um and so-called you know isolation or social distancing really tending to our relationships and thinking strategically about how we can organize how we can have consensus-based movements or whatever structures and, and frameworks we need um, because that's something we really had a crash crash course in and are still uh as a as a you know uh, family as a, as a youth for Yinta are still kind of navigating the best ways and protocols to carry that out, especially when you're bringing together many nations. 
But the other thing I think that's much more simplistic and, and incredibly obvious is that we are watching right now Jason Kenney vie for the deregulation of industry, vie for using this as an opportunity to have a Canadian populace that's distracted to push through um, every resource extraction project imaginable from pipelines to mining, uh, especially in remote territories where they feel as though there isn't surveillance. And when you literally have, uh, you know, a Canadian broadcasting company that 24 seven is talking about nothing other than this pandemic, it's an ideal time to deregulate and railroad through and break your own laws as a nation. And we've seen this happen before. This is not, this comes straight out of a political playbook. So it doesn't need to be a surprise to us. We can actually really expect what we're going to see in terms of trying to railroad industry through. And we just need to have a, a very uh, superficial understanding of Canadian history to, to know what that looks like. And so I think we need to be as, as overwhelming as this situation is um, regarding the pandemic and the fear and all of that. That fear is very intentionally being utilized uh, to disempower us as a nation, as both as Indigenous people and settler people, um, to be distracted so that economic projects that ultimately don't serve anyone's aim, especially as Frida said, when you see that this entire economy is fictitious within a month, half of the businesses in our community have gone bankrupt. And now more than ever, what we do need is clean air and clean water and access to soil that we can cultivate. And yet still, we have political leaders fighting to put through industrial projects that will, will ultimately make our landscapes uninhabitable for not only for human but for all creatures. And so I think that we need to be self-disciplined enough to remain vigilant uh, despite the narratives that are intentionally trying to disempower and distract us, but to prepare ourselves exactly as Colin said, to take that on head on and call it out as it, as it goes on. And I know that there's many people in the Yinta who are preparing to do that, but as collectively as Canadians who can't be on that land, we need to find ways to amplify those messages as well as to hold politicians and corporations to account. And if that means engaging international watchdog agencies and engaging international human rights policy as well, then that's something we need to start preparing to do as well as different legal cases to do everything we can to prevent that from, from being pushed through, which is exactly what, what is the legwork is being done right now to ensure that that happens while the rest of Canada is, is uh, self-quarantining and you know occupied by trying to avoid bacteria. Great, thank you, Nikki. Uh, that's an important note to end on. I think uh, is how to how to keep this fight going and and you know stay vigilant against the uh, the forces that are going to um, to use this in order to uh, further their own ends. Um, I think you know we're a little bit over time, so I think maybe we'll uh, we'll skip uh, Q and A from the audience. Um, Folks are welcome if the speakers would like to stick around for us a bit after, we can keep the meeting open. But uh, until then, um, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you so much to the speakers uh, for your work and for, for speaking with us tonight. Um, it was incredible to hear all of the, uh, the wisdom that you have and, um, and your reflections on, on the events earlier this year. Um, thanks to Don for uh, a brief, cameo and uh and thanks to everybody who joined us uh if you have any feedback please let us know uh this is our first kind of go at uh at a major kind of zoom event and so we'd be happy to uh to to work anything in it's uh peter at wildernesscommittee.org um get uh make sure to get on our action alert list if you're not already on there you can sign up wildernesscommittee.org make sure to uh support the unistoten camp um, the Unistoten Village and What's What in Sovereignty, um, you know, donate to the legal fund and, uh, and make sure that you're, you're getting the emails from the Unistoten Solidarity Blockade. Uh, you can find all that stuff on their website and we'll, we'll link it in the chat here. Um, and yeah, just, just thanks for joining. Uh, speakers, if you have to go, totally don't worry about it. Um, but if you're able to stick around uh, for maybe another 10 minutes for a couple of questions, let's people go. Uh, we'd sure appreciate it. Thanks. Hey Peter. Yep. Yeah. I just had a quick question for folks that want to support financially through a donation. Um, if anyone wants to provide a link for folks to, to do so, that would be great. Just 
in the chat if any of the indigenous youth or Frida or Eve have a link to donate. That would be awesome. I believe we have a donate link on our Facebook page as well as our Buddhist.den camp website. Great, I can provide that in the chat box for folks that want to donate. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thanks for for sticking with us, speakers. Maybe we'll just do uh, we'll just do one or two quick questions. Um, just and I think um, because Eve is not under, I think it's Yenta Access. I can I think that's what the name of their site is. Right. Or get them Dan, because they have two camps that are still up that are monitoring what's going on out still down with the industry going through their territory. I'll look it up quickly. And Sounds good. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks again to Eve as well for uh, for joining us until the phone ran out. I know that's such a front, just frontline things. Um, so folks wanna, if you have one incredible burning question for our speakers before we go, uh, you can you can write it into the chat. We'll open it up um, and we'll pick pick one for for folks to answer. I have a question here um, from the chat. It's from Isaac Beaver, and he asks, are there any learnings or improvements we can take from the solidarity actions this year so they are even more effective next time? If anyone wants to answer that. Can you just repeat that question once more? Sure. It is, are there any learnings or improvements we can take from the solidarity actions this year so, so that they are even more effective next time? I can jump in um, just from my role uh, specifically, which was um, doing media coordination and um, we, I had a lot of faith initially um, that the coverage that we were um, going to be given would be fair and, um, you know, dynamic and would gi give credit to the complexity of the issues. And we learned very rapidly um, that the Canadian media does not have the capacity, nor does it have the decolonial or critical analysis to talk about these issues in a meaningful way. And ultimately, so much of the coverage actually incited violence and incited racism uh, towards what, what are some of the most vulnerable um, populations in Canada, specifically two-spirit and, um, and female-identified Indigenous young women. Um, and so one of the things I think that is really important and um, that I think we really need to do a better job of with, with NGOs, with Enviros, with our, with our First Nations and with our collectives is really um, unifying our own messaging, supporting one another in disseminating messaging and amplifying messaging and really dictating our own narratives. And there's never been a better time in history um, to do that than now with the technological abilities that we have access to. But I really, especially as a media professional, really had a rude awakening in terms of the inability, whether it's conscious or not, um, for the, the um, mainstream media to actually even comprehend or have an ability to, to uh, engage with these issues in a meaningful way that would do anything other than incite racism and violence against Indigenous people. So that's a huge one is really that dictating of our own narratives and getting ahead of the story and finding our own outlets to speak our truth rather than relying on the mainstream media because they don't have the capacity nor do they have uh, the desire. <clears throat> I think to also build on that just on like the three themes like a around um, the solidarity in which we organize as a collective to come together um, as it for a unified cause and understanding the power dynamics and the lived experiences that come um, come come out during those relationship building 
times, like with uh, environmental orgs or with uh, settler organized groups to stand in solidarity and to see the difference between uh, indigenous led um, solidarity movements, uh, especially around young people and how many of these people on this call and in general that have come together, take it as like a personal responsibility and a family obligation to the territories and understanding the stakes in which we all carry in, in the larger picture and how that interacts on an interpersonal level when we organize together. And I think we learned a lot of that when um, uh, there was organizing happening um, in the South here. and. Um, I think also just like positionality within politics in general, just understanding how we can come together, um, recognizing our unique uh, individual capacity while also seeing how everyone has a role and everyone can have a responsibility and just how to communicate that to each other. I think that was a really interesting part of standing in solidarity. And then also as to Nikki's point around the complexity and relaying that to a larger public eye, um, is to be able to have and carry out those dialogues that recognize that complexity, even in our personal relationships, for example, around um, the difference between uh, uh, power structures within like a DIA, like a Department of Indian Affairs system, like um, Indian Act bans, and um, sovereign, sovereign nationhood um, that exist outside of the realms of that, and what that means also for individuals standing in solidarity within their own political contexts um, of that hereditary right. So just around what we can learn for next time is just hold, being able to hold as much space as possible to learn as we go. And if there are mistakes being made, to be able to have that direct conversation and ability to communicate across the colonial boundaries that are meant to keep us apart. Um, so just making sure that like, we're, we have that opportunity to um, engage with each other on a human level and not program ourselves to have a right and wrong, but to be able to be fluid and be able to hold ourselves accountable as, and not rely on an outside structure or an organization to do that. And whether that's in like a position within an, um, a non-for-profit, whether that's a position in a community group like Extinction Rebellion or um, other community groups that stand in solidarity um, with Indigenous peoples, nations, and, and resistance, and um, seeing how we can all work towards the future um, you know, we talk about just transitions, we talk about having a just future for all, but ultimately, like, if we don't take the time to do that now, we'll just be recreating the same type of world that we're in today. So, it's a really good question. Awesome, thank you so much for those amazing words. Um, others, last chance. Do you have anything to add on that question? Seeing nothing? What was the question again? <laughs> uh, the question was, was there anything we learned from the solidarity actions and uh, land defense from earlier this year uh, that we think we can improve on and like do to make them more effective and, and better next time? I find for us, you have to have your own media team for all the 10 years that we've been doing this our success has been independent media and i had my own media team on site and i had a media room set up so that anything and everything that was important that needed to get out and a lot of the media sources ended up taking from our own media so that they weren't twisting and making their story that we were always telling our story even though every now and then sometimes they would steal snippets and still tell their story but like i said it earlier in my comments that mainstream media gets a lot of its fun from corporation and then government so of course they're gonna tell the story that benefits those those organizations that fund them so we're not the big we're not the people with the big dollars so they're not going to tell our story so that's why it's important to have your own media and we're fortunate to have a very skilled team that knows how to Put a good story together and get it out there quick so i'm not afraid to get right in there down and dirty right into where all the action's happening and if it wasn't for our own media what happened last year with that military force use that real story would not have gotten out and if you notice they tried to 
blocked the media out, but by the time when they got to us, they wouldn't, they didn't get the media to leave. Would they were staying right where we were and so that's how I said it's important to have your own media team. So whoever's doing any kind of work, find skilled, there's lots of skilled people out there that to see if they can get committed or if they can't commit for the whole length of your project to that person to line up more media people to come stand by you when, with everything you're doing so they can capture everything so that you're telling your story and the media is not twisting it and making you look like the bad guys and doing a good story for industry and government. So media is important. It certainly is. Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, to all of our speakers again and to everyone here. It was so lovely to see you all. And uh, I really hope we can uh, see each other again soon. Please stay safe and, uh, and take care and keep up the fight. Take care, everyone. Thank you. I love you. Hi, Chica. Thanks for having us. Stay safe, everybody.